Hey folks, I'm Demotro. Welcome back to Combo Class. I bet most of you already know about prime factorizations, where you can take a whole number and split it into its factors and split those into factors and etc. And you'll eventually reach a point where they're only prime numbers, which are typically written in an ascending order based on the prime size, and then given exponents based on how many times they occurred, with the first power ones sometimes left blank because that implies the first power. But many of you may not know that there are some extensions we can make to the system of prime factorizations that will let them describe much more than just whole numbers. Whenever you make a change or an extension to a current system that's currently working pretty well, you'll want to keep in mind not just what rules you were previously following or what you were allowing in the system normally, but also what you were getting from the system. Like what benefits it might have that you may not want to lose when you make any changes. In the case of prime factorizations, we allowed a string of things multiplied together where those things involved some base number raised to some exponent number as a power, and the base numbers were allowed to be distinct primes, and the exponents were allowed to be any positive integer. And what we got from that system was that every positive integer has exactly one prime factorization that describes it. A lot of people say that prime factorizations can only describe positive integers larger than one, but the number one is unique out of the positive integers in that it has no primes making it up, which means that if we allow the prime factorization containing nothing to be a prime factorization, that lines up perfectly with the number one. And we will say it has a unique prime factorization, just that that prime factorization is the empty one. No positive integer will have multiple prime factorizations or be lacking one. And it also works the other way around too, where any prime factorization you could invent or imagine that follows these rules will line up with exactly one positive integer. And that turns out to be a really useful property. So let's say today, we're gonna try and make some changes to what we allow without losing the property that all of the positive integers lined up in a one-to-one -one unique way with the prime factorizations. So let's see what happens when we make a few extensions to what was allowed. For example, what if we allowed the base numbers, which typically were just primes, to include the number one? which we could either phrase as letting it be the primes or one, or we could phrase as one is a prime, like some mathematicians at points in history have considered it. Well, what we'll get from that is that a number like 12, which normally has a unique singular prime factorization of two squared times three, could now be written as that same thing times a one, or times another one, or as many ones as I want. And we would lose that property where there was a one-to-one -one correlation of the positive integers only having a single prime factorization. And that's actually one of the main reasons why the number one isn't considered a prime. So those base numbers can't include one today, but what if they included other composite numbers? Like what if I could have four to some power in the mix of the prime factorization? Well, then 12 could be written that good old way, like two squared times three, or as four times three. And we would lose the property automatically with any composite number as a base, because it could be rewritten as its prime factor. Factorization. And if we allowed our base numbers to include a zero, that wouldn't show up in the prime factorization of any positive number ever, so we could only try and use it to extend prime factorizations into describing zero itself, but even in that one context where it could show up, it would break that rule we wanted to preserve. 
Now, since prime factorizations can only describe positive integers and we attach a minus or negative symbol after the fact if you want to change the sign, you might wonder, what if the base numbers tried including negative versions of primes and then you raised those to powers and got the negativeness in there right away? But we're going to hit more double representations, like 12 could be written 2 squared times 3, or could be written negative 2 squared times 3. We'll hit an even worse version of that problem if we let a base number be imaginary, like having one of them be I, because imaginary numbers move in a cyclical pattern when you apply exponents to them, where I to the power of four or to the power of any multiple of four equals one, which would leave every number with an infinite amount of possible prime factorizations. You might try non-integer numbers like fractions or square roots, but we're gonna run into issues because something like one third times three gives us one and could be attached to any of these. And something like square root of three squared is the same as writing a three. So we'd once again have multiple representations. There's not really any any way to change those base numbers from primes to anything else while still having that unique multiplicative structure for the integers. So if we want to change something, it's going to have to be the exponents. Typically, the exponents in a prime factorization are positive integers. But what if we allowed some to be zero? Well, any prime to the zeroth power is going to be one. And to get a gut feeling for why that's the case, let's note that any real number's first power compared to its second power is like multiplying by that number on the base once. And if we ever compare it to one power higher, we are multiplying by that base number again. Or if we compare one to an exponent one lower, it's like dividing by that number. And so if we take that one step further and subtract one from that exponent and divide by the base number in the process, we get n over n equals one. So any prime that we attached a zero with power to would create a one, which will run us into that issue where we could include as many ones as we did or didn't choose. However, there is a way that we could include zeros if we decide to view prime factorizations in an alternate but technically fully true way which is that we could imagine every prime, the infinite amount of them being within each prime factorization, and that all of the ones that aren't really building into the number have a zeroth power. Like 12 here would be two squared times three times five to the zeroth power times seven to the zeroth power and all the other primes to the zeroth power. So in a way, it's completely valid to view prime factorizations as having an infinite amount of base numbers, an infinite amount of which have the exponent zero, but we'll describe it in the more common way where prime factorizations are finite length and none of the terms are allowed to have the exponent zero, which may make some people think we've hit a brick wall because we were using positive integers as exponents and then we go downward to zero and that didn't work. But if you look on the other side of that brick wall, there are negative numbers. So what if instead of just positive integers, we allowed negative integers, not as the base numbers, which didn't work, but as the exponents. And we can get a gut feeling for negative powers in this same way, where if I subtract one from the power there, we should be dividing by n, and that was one, so one divided by n will be equivalent 
constant to n to the negative first power. And if I take that further and go down to the negative second power, dividing by n again, we're at 1 over n squared. So essentially, a negative exponent is going to be like the reciprocal of the number to that magnitude of power. If you were investigating this, you might test some previous prime factorization we'd had, like that one for 12, and turn one of the positive exponents negative. Like, let's see what 2 to the negative second power times 3 would give us. Well, that would turn into 3 divided by 2 squared, which is 4. That seems to be a prime factorization of the fraction 3 fourths. And if you saw that some of these seemed to work, you might wonder, do all the fractions work? Does every rational number have some way of giving it a prime factorization? It turns out that it works even better than you might expect. If we change our exponent restriction from positive integers to non-zero integers, then every positive rational number has exactly one prime factorization. That includes all of the integers and preserves our old rule while adding to it. And in fact, I'm shocked that this isn't the way prime factorization are defined or that this isn't taught more commonly. A lot of schools and teachers say that prime factorizations can only be for positive exponents. But why? We could have had them defined as including that as part of a whole larger realm. So knowing that this works, how could this trait be helpful? Well, prime factorizations were already able to help us look at integers that might otherwise look similar to each other, like all these ones in the upper 20s, and see their truly different structures, like this one being super thriven, this one being pretty even and a little bit divisible by seven, this one being prime, and so on. But now we don't have to limit ourselves to just the integers. We can zoom in on other positive rational numbers that might otherwise look really similar to each other, like 28.6 and 0.7 and so on here, and see their structures. These numbers you might sometimes see as decimals or mixed numbers, which really hide their structures, and you might sometimes see them as single fractions, which get us closer, but you'll rarely see their unique prime factorizations, which do tell us a lot of details details about what does or doesn't make up each of them. Now, the focus of this episode was to show how I think that these negative exponents are super useful, don't sacrifice anything from the previous system, and should be part of the definition that these are usually taught as. But it isn't necessarily even the only extension we could allow. There are other ways we could try tweaking the exponents, feeding in new types of number into the exponent options to generate new types of number that we had a representation for. Like, now that we've made fractions be able to have a representation, what if we let fractions be exponents? What if we let some of these primes that were the base numbers be raised to things like the power of one half, which is equivalent to the principal square root of the number, or the power of one third, which is equivalent to the principal cube root of the number. That would allow us to unlock a whole new realm of numbers. This wouldn't allow us to make every single irrational number, even some algebra algebraic irrational numbers like the golden ratio, which is one plus square root of five all over two, would be hard to make with a multiplicative structure like a prime factorization due to that plus in there. But it would allow us to unlock whole new realms of number. Like if I came across two times square root of three all over five, 
now that would have a prime factorization of two to the first power times three to the power of one half times five to the negative first power. We could even take it further and now allow square roots and cube roots and other numbers of this type as exponents, maybe iterating the process where at each stage, whatever set of numbers we had just created prime factorizations for, we then allowed to be exponent possibilities and see what realm of numbers that gives new representations for. But I'm not really sure what would happen if we continued that process and when we might hit limitations, like if we'd run into double representations for those old rational numbers and lose that property. I'm not sure because there's not much information about this stuff I could find beyond this idea of allowing negative integers as exponents. I couldn't find anything about fractional or square rooty exponents in terms of preserving this rule about prime factorizations. I'll think about it some more and it might show up in a future episode, but definitely leave me a comment if you figure out anything fun about this. And that's all for today's lesson, but it's just the start of our grade negative two mathematical adventures. I'll see you in the next episode and I hope you have a great day.